welcome everyone and welcome Luis Mihuel. Uh, once again, thank you for accepting our invitation. So I met Luis Mihuel in 2019 in Canberra at a conference and uh, I've been planning to invite him ever since then. First, we thought about a real physical invitation, but that proved to be a bit difficult. And after that, 2020 happened and things have changed a lot since then. And now these online meetings and online conferences are quite mainstream. So we decided to give this format a try for the invitation. And uh, here we are. So uh, before the uh, talk, I would like to say a few words about Luis Mihuel. So uh, Dr. Luis Mihuel Rojas Bersha was born in Lima, Peru in 1991 and he studied Hispanic linguistics there at the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. Then he moved to the Netherlands where he obtained his MA and PhD degrees at the Catholic University of Nijmegen. Uh, to date, he has written two books and the latest one, which has just been published by the John Benjamin's publishing company, is titled Prehistorical Language Contact in Peruvian Amazonia, a Dynamic Approach to Xavi. Currently, he's a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, he has a really broad range of research interests, including fieldwork based approaches to typology, dialectology, contact linguistics, and quantitative social linguistics. Uh, he has in investigated a large number of languages, including Amazonian languages such as Shavi, uh, Shivilu, uh, Upper Amazonian Quechua. East Asian languages such as Mandarin Chinese, Hakka Chinese, and Yilan Japanese, and also Western Australian languages such as Kukatya. And right now his research is focused on this latter language, and he's particularly interested in the historical coming about of uh, this contact language, as well as the ongoing contact induced language change due to the imminent arrival of Creole and English. So uh, this sounds really fascinating to me. So I'm sure we are going to have a very, very interesting talk and, uh, and a very good discussion session after that. So that's what I wanted to say. Uh, Luis, uh, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, uh, Yuri, Peter, thank you for the invitation. Thank you uh, to the Hungarian Academy of Sciences for uh, this honor. I. Uh, I, I'm really honored to be here, to be sharing my ideas with all of you and we all, with all the people that have joined and we will watch this video later. The, um, the talk I have prepared for you today is titled The Myth of a Monoglossic Competence. Let me share my screen. Let's see. I hope you can see. Let me know if you can see what I'm seeing at the... <laughs> At the, uh, currently, so the myth of a monoglossic competence cases from northwestern Amazonia and Western Australia through the lenses of dynamic linguistics. Um, here you see a picture of a consultant of mine in uh, in Brazil, in the Xingu area. Another, well, it's an, one of the areas I'm currently interested in. I'm l also investigating some multilingual practices in the Xingu but unfortunately due to time I won't be able to focus on that today. So what I have prepared for you is a bit of an introduction to what I um, dub dynamic linguistics which is more of a continuation of the efforts started in the, 70, the 60s and the 70s in the field of generative semantics and early sociolinguistics. Um, what we call a polyelectral internally dynamic competence. Uh, here you see that's a model envisaged by Charles Bailey in the 70s, followed well and somehow developed simultaneously by Peter Surin in the 80s. These are modular approaches to language variation and change, but we'll have a look at that in a moment. Um, the difference between static and dynamic linguistics, but most of the time I'll be focusing on the examples from South America and Western Australia that I think are the, um, the hallmark of this talk and um, two great examples to illustrate um, the dynamic nature of a linguistic competence and how these can 
enrich our typological approaches to language as well as our current understanding of competence from a well modular or a, a well even generative perspective let's have a look first of all i would like to talk about these the language problem this is something that has been um, next to me for a while in my heart for a long time since i was a student and that has to do with the fact that we as linguists we tend to assume the fact that language is a sort is a is a sort of is some sort of a totemic uh, entity that we have to study isolated from everything but language seems not to be like that at all and with these i am um, i'm referring to the idea that a language say a language a or a language b uh, come from a single language x say a proto language it descends from that one it may be in contact with other languages that influence this new language and this language uh, eventually may split into further languages or may disappear um, this is a view that was criticized a lot in the early history of historical linguistics and at some point that's what uh, triggered the advent of wave theory and um, uh, with Schmidt and Schuchat, uh, but we will have a look at that in a moment. So when we think of a language, we tend to think of a unit, a unit that is isolated in time, and that is um, in time, space, and everything, and that stems a lot from our European um, Western views of language. In Europe, a place where standardization, the history of literacy, has influenced a lot of our, our ideas on language, this is the case, you know, even in the case of, uh, uh, well, even now in the European linguistics, historical linguistics, we tend to think as languages as entities such as this, you know, uh, a totem, a unit that stems from another unit, and then we have all these beautiful trees. This seems to be uh, very general, of course. Many modern historical linguists would say that uh, this is not, well, this is just a generalization, but there are very complex processes of language contact and language variation that take place. But even so, in typology, in descriptive linguistics, we tend to assume this view. We write grammars, for instance, a, a grammar of um, of Shipibo, a grammar of Girbal, uh, a grammar of Dirin, a grammar of uh, X, Y, Z languages, as if they were completely isolated, as if there was a single way, a single competence, you know. In my own experience, um, I have seen that uh, that is not necessarily the case, at least in, we will have a look in a moment. In the case of Western Australia, it seems that competence is a bit like a cake, uh, a bit of a multi-layered cake, as if a single language could show different bits and pieces from different places that are constantly being put together uh, in time recursively. You know, it is as if competence is something that's built uh, continuously through time in life um, when we are in contact with other people. And that doesn't necessarily only mean the people that speak our own language, because for instance, that's the idea we have in Europe. If you in Hungary, for instance, speak to one another, you are just sharing very Hungarian-like uh, types of information. But in places like Western Australia, where multilingualism is rampant, what you will have is um, people getting in contact with other people that speak in a very different way. And through time, we will see that people incorporate this very different bits and pieces of grammar and lexicon into their own competence. And then you have this multi-layered cake. Now, if we get to another part of the world, for instance, to Northwestern Amazonia, what we will see, well, when I started, for instance, studying languages from Northwestern Amazonia, we will once again see this unit, a cake, you will say, bam, 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 bits and pieces of, uh, well, units of, um, tons of units, tons of different languages. But actually, this unit can also be subdivided. Uh, we also see that this unit is layered, but this um, layered uh, cake seems to be a historical layered cake. Um, seems to have been historically layered. It's not that uh, people interact with uh, other people that um, have a, a command of a very different linguistic system, so that they have to share very different lexicon and syntactic constructions. 
that may not be the case anymore. But when you look at the, at the languages they speak, you will see that uh, in the history of that language that may have happened back in the day, three, four, five or ten generations in the past. Now, this is a bit cryptic at the moment, but with the examples, I hope this becomes clearer. So, first of all, I would like to introduce this concept, the concept of a glossography of power that's pretty much entrenched in our modern ideas of what a language is, of what is not a language, what is a language, what is a dialect, what is a language variety, etc. You know, in the case at least of South America, what is or what is not a language was pretty much influenced by the arrival of Europeans. Before the arrival of Europeans, before the, these very artificial um, uh, limit, the limitations of, a, of our geography, um, the difference between what was language A, B, C or D was pretty much in flux, you know, was not really there. You know, people had an idea of what was their own language, and that is, for example, the case of Quechua. When the Spaniards arrived in um, uh, pre-colonial Peru, they found that many people would say they spoke a variety, or they spoke Quechua, you know, but the difference between all these Quechuas was massive, you know. Um, uh, it's more or less like the difference between modern Romanian and Spanish. Um, so no mutual intelligibility at all. But they would still assume that they have the same identity and for them these two languages would still be the same. It was pretty uh, similar to the situation before the, um, the standardization of Romance languages. You know, people would say they, they, they spoke uh, some Romance, Romance, and they would have this sort of identity related to the Roman and, uh, and, the, and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but that was it, you know. So Spaniards, in a way, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, inserted in society these ideas of where a language begins and a language ends. And they named, of course, of the languages that they found not only in the coast of Peru where they arrived, but also in the Andes, in the Amazon, in the deep Amazon. And the Portuguese did the same in um, what is today modern Brazil. The same happened in other parts of the world, the same happened here in Australia. And that is what we call the glossography, what I actually dubbed the glossography of power. I wrote about this in my thesis, and this has now been made available in my recent book published with uh, John Benjamin's uh, Prehistorical Contact in Peruvian Amazonia, where I developed these ideas a bit more. But what we see is that there was not only a, um, an actual delimitation of territory saying this country, this vice royalty starts here and there, but this also happened with languages. And later on, when we linguists want to study these languages, sometimes we overlook these things and we just look at the modern uh, delimitations, these modern units, but we forget that before the arrival of the Spaniards, these things were maybe, were possibly not there at all. You know, there were things in flux things that were um, in much more contact than they are or were. Then, now let's get to uh, the historical, well, the theoretical part of this talk. The ideas, these ideas on language and language fluidity on, on an, a polyglossic competence, so the idea that competence is not something that's just in our minds, but it's constantly being reshaped with interaction or through interaction, is something that stems actually from the end of the linguistic wars, wars the late 60s and the early 70s. Uh, you know well, uh, what the linguistics wars are. Uh, there are some LFG people here. They know what this is. For them, it's the past. For me, it's, um, <laughs> it's the present. But basically, the struggle uh, um, was here, you know, in the idea of what was behind grammar, what was at the level of deep structures. For people defending the idea of an autonomous syntax, what was there was mere structure, you know. But for the so-called generative semantics, what was there was semantics, a semantic analysis or a semantic deep structure or a semantic representation that through um, um, transformations, that is our grammar, 
would end up being transformed into surface structures. Okay, so these things here, the semantic representation of sem or semantic analysis, was the thing that was to some extent um, questioned by people following the autonomous syntax um, ideas and what we know today as modern Chomskyans, people following the government and binding parameters, etc. Um, and also, of course, the minimalist program. Um, the LFG people are not really like that. They don't follow these anymore, I would say. And uh, we agree with them to some extent. But I will leave that for the questions if that is the case, if it's possible. Okay, what is to know a language then for these people, generative semantics or modern syntact, uh, semantic syntacticians? To know a language does not only mean to have the ability of converting meanings into well-formed strings of symbols and vice versa, but also to be able to distinguish between standard, substandard, formal, informal, dialectally and sociolectally marked forms of speech. And of course, and this is a, a extracted from Surin, a view of language, Surin, my mentor, Professor Surin, who's a scholar from the Max Planck Institute of Psycholinguistics. But um, of course, to know a language would also mean that we are constantly uh, mapping what others are saying and adapting our competences recursively. Um, when these ideas uh, came into being in the early 70s, this concept was also coined. The concept of LICT, um, of course, coming from all these um, uh, terms that we use in linguistics, such as dialect, sociolect, etc. And LICT is a completely non committal term for any bundling together of linguistic phenomena. This was coined actually by Charles Bailey in 1973. You can have a look at his book, Variation in Linguistic Theory. And what he, why he coined this term, well, um, he coined this term because he meant that competences, the linguistic competence we have in our mind, was polylectal, that is an assemblage of different lects whose origins we may know or know nothing about, you know. Um, um, but we'll get to that in a bit. So, People following the ideas of a polylectal competence of generative, uh, generative semantics um, established what's, so, what's known as a dynamic paradigm. And I consider myself a follower of the dynamic paradigm. And the others, we can, uh, we can actually say that modern formal syntacticians in many ways follow a static paradigm. I'm not saying LFG people in this case, I'm mostly referring to modern Chomskyans. So what's the difference between a static and a dynamic paradigm? First, for a static linguist, variation other than morphophonic variation is to be relegated to the category of performance and excluded from the work of the descriptivist. I think you know that when we teach um, generative syntax to students, sometimes we have to make this clear. For a dynamic linguist, a variation above the level of systematic phonetics is structure and can be reliably attributed to what language users know about their language. It must be expressed in an adequate grammar. That was also incorporated by uh, early sociolinguists before the separation of the so-called waves of sociolinguistics. But uh, first wave sociolinguists incorporated variation into the grammatical machinery of language. These ideas were actually um, um, conceived by Schuchart, but sometimes we forget about that. Then two, creel situations are freak situations. Creoles are necessarily unstable and rapidly changing. But two, for dynamicists, creolization is normal. All languages may have been once uh, creoles. And with these, I, I don't mean creoles in the socio-historical sense, but may have had structure similar to, similar to what we see in creoles, that is semantically transparent structures, structures that really show the nature of semantic analysis. And this is following the principle of semantic transparency sketch in Surin, and later exploring Mausk in 2000 and myself in 2020. Three. Homogeneity is a necessary and useful fiction that will not vitiate linguistic theory or, or analysis, um, pretty much followed by modern syntacticians. Homogeneity would be dysfunctional in language, sweeping variation, and that the rack is deleterious to theory and analysis. So for us, we cannot really assume a homogeneous perspective. Actually, 
we are actually we we would be actually um, sweeping under the rug one of the most important, if not the most important, characteristic of language. Um, four, relations among different grammars can be adequately portrayed with a family tree model. This once more gets to the point that I made at the beginning regarding units. But for a wave model is required for explaining patterns of variation in language data and required, but not necessarily the one and only, of course. Um, uh, the dynamic approach assumes vertical and horizontal variation as intertwined, just to make this clear. Five, descriptions of language should be purely static and exclude temporal relations. This was, to some extent, um, um, superseded by some poly, what are they called um, among functionalists? Um, not polylectal, but well, they have another name. I think Nick Evans wrote something of the sorts. But um, for dynamicists, directionality and relative rate of change can and should be incorporated into the descriptive apparatus of grammars. And that would mean that we would need to make polylectal grammars. If we really want to um, provide an adequate description of competence in a speaker or a community, we really cannot uh, forget about directionality and relative rate of change. Six, idiolects are more systematic than higher abstractions. Commutation tests actually adequately, sorry, reflect language users knowledge of the language, but no, idiolects are not systematic and monitored production is more systematic than monitored production. Sometimes monitored production uh, clouds our <laughs> what we are actually studying. Seven, the Saussurian paradox. Competence is looked for exclusively in the individual, but the variety is sought in society. Seven, competence, that is the individual one. What language users know about communicating with others more nearly represents a language competence and the subset of his knowledge exhibited in production. So actually, even at the individual level, there is variation. I think we would all agree on that, but I don't know. <laughs> Eight, intelligibility among different varieties of a language depends on good guessing, which is in turn based on similarities. And eight, intelligibility among different legs is predicted either on their thought systematicity or in the case of decreolizing gradients on one's internalization of the algorithms according to which related systems are mixed. And we will see that this is actually the case in many Aboriginal language communities in Australia where people don't actually share a language but they communicate with one another. I will make the point about this in a moment. So what does actually competence um, uh, look like? I would say it looks a bit uh, like something like this is to say the competence of um, speaker X that has to communicate with different people in different situations and depending on who or um, what situation where um, etc and in what uh, um, time of his of his or her, her life he, he or she communicates they will have to um, uh, make a choice you know they will have to based on all these parameters, the geographical, sociological, interactional, and even the diachronic development parameter, accommodate their competence to these different speakers uh, all the time. And we are constantly doing that, and we are constantly changing. This, of course, would apply, for instance, for Peter, who speaks Hungarian, uh, to his family, to his friends, to you at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, but it would also apply to a Shawi speaker who speaks to other Shawis, who speaks to people speaking Spanish in the cities, and this would also apply to an Aboriginal Australia who has Aboriginal Australian in Balgo, who has to, uh, to these people, for instance, to Alpha, he has to speak in a sort of Kukaja-like variety, to Enman, he has to speak more in a world pre like variety and these people were talking world pre back to him and this would, each one of these cases would be like another language you know so in many in in a, in in the case of in some communities in the so-called multilingual communities that i prefer to call poly um polyglossic what we have is that for us that we are used to this unitary view of language we would have tons of languages interacting and for monoglossic for the monoglossic view we would have just one language and different people speaking different varieties but it's actually the same thing actually the same thing the only difference lies at the at the at the weight of the of the of the processing incompetence um, so you can say at the processing load in the machinery of language 
uh, because of, for instance, different branching directionality types clashing together in competence, different types of lexicon, etc., different types of um, phonology, uh, getting in contact, etc. When things are more similar, it seems for us that we are dealing with a single language. When all these things are different, it seems that we are dealing with different languages in contact, but it's actually one thing. All, comp all interaction is polyglossic, even at the individual, very uh, monolingual type of communication. I can leave that for the questions anyway. So what we actually have, uh, if we follow a flex approach, a more dynamic approach to language, what we have always is a social force acting upon given lects and playing with the linguemes of a given lect. These linguemes, uh, um, this was a term coined by Croft, actually by Croft and Haspelmath, who knows who was the first one who coined that term, but we could, we could say that linguemes are these units um, uh, say constructions whatsoever that are stored in our minds and that are constantly being changed in the process of cultural selection and communication. A flux is a dynamic process which involves a social force conditionant and not determinant. So in this case, I disagree with Treadgill, acting upon a set of linguines in a given lect. Now, let's get to the examples. You know, to um, uh, the examples I brought from Western Australia and, um, and Northwestern Amazonia in Peru. When I was studying um, languages, I, I actually started with the Amazon, but I will give you a sort of um, uh, back in time, you know, a, <laughs> uh, we will go backtrack to the understanding of, of the dynamic model. I will show you first the case of a very Poly, multilingual scenario where we, it seems there are many, many languages getting in contact. And then we will get more into a unit like case that is the Shawi case in northwestern Amazonia. We will see that that is just but an illusion. If we look at the history of the language, we will see that it, it was pretty much like the Australian case. So this is a picture of, um, of the Kimberleys in western Australia. Uh, you see all these colors reflect one, uh, well, reflect, reflect different languages. I work on Kukaja, a language spoken in the easternmost part of the Kimberley. So this is the Kimberleys, okay? This is the easternmost part of the Kimberleys. This is a bit of the northern territory, actually, of Australia. And it is considered to be uh, a language belonging to the Wati or Western Desert branch of the Pamanyungan language family. As you see, this language um, is next to other languages such as Walmajari, Jaru, Ngardi, and Walpri, and well, a bit of Gurindji here. These are so-called uh, Ngumbin Yapa languages, also Pamanyungan languages, but we could say that the difference between Western or Wati languages and these uh, Ngumbin Yapa languages is similar to that between, I would dare to say, between we could say between Hungarian and Finnish. Well, I wouldn't say that far. Maybe Hungarian and Damanti varieties in Asia, you know. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, I think it's a bit closer because they actually managed to understand each other. Maybe a bit like uh, very unknown varieties of Romans and, and Spanish. And then also, uh, Kukaj is also in contact with languages like Kuniyan, like Punupa, like Kija, that are non pamanyungan languages. They are not related with these languages at all. You know, they have a very different lexicon, a very different grammar. They are prefixing languages. These languages are suffixing languages, um, etc. They, they have a different phonological system and well, so on and so forth. They, they are very different. Okay, so yeah, many colors, many languages. The nice thing about this map. Um, designed by Ayatsis is that uh, the limits are a bit blurry, you know, and that is nice because uh, if you look at the maps from a few uh, hundred years ago, the languages were in, in different positions, you know. Uh, Kukaja was not there at all, for instance. Um, I will get to that in a bit. Okay, so these are some pictures of my work with the Kukaja people. I have been working with them for the past couple of years now, 
Uh, I worked with uh, 39 speakers. Kukaja is only spoken by some 300 people in Western Australia, so it's not much. You know, 39 is quite okay, you know, for the, it's, it's quite a good number for that. Uh, these are 19 young adults, 10 adults, and 10 elders, uh, 10 women, sadly only 10 women. Why is that? Because it's difficult to work with, um, with women if you're a man, you know, in these communities, you need to get permission from the husband, the father, sometimes they don't want you, they are, um, well, there are many problems. If you're a woman, it's the opposite, you know, there are difficulties when you have to work with men. There are no monolinguals. Most people speak at least two languages. Some people speak over seven languages, you know, so it's a, a land of polyglots. These are two of my consultants. They were showing me uh, some of the, um, um, as you see, there there are some very nice little plateaus there. <laughs> um, they all have their own their own history, their own dream, as they call it here. And these are some pictures of the field work. As you see, uh, I don't want to sound like the Indiana Jones sitting with them in the desert, you know, eating worms with them. Their life is pretty much like ours these days. You know, sometimes we play video games. Sometimes we sit at the Wakala Center. I collect data with tablets, with um, with modern recorders. You know, they can use computers, and um, I try to make this as 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 friendly as possible with them. You know, so um, these, for instance, these are two of my main consultants, um, Clifford and Caleb. This is a, a very wise man, George. He was a great guide in the community, and these are three of my elder consultants, uh, Jupiter, Mari and Helen. Of course, I have an authorization to share uh, pictures with, uh, with you, right? So if we look at the history of these, um, of Kukaja, what we see is that uh, people at least talk of different stages of Kukaja. They have an idea of what we're talking about when we mention, um, it's not that I am inventing these categories. These are categories actually given to me by them. Uh, what they say is that back in the day, there was a variety they would call old Kukaja that uh, is, can be found actually in the legacy recordings currently archived in the Wakala Center. Sadly, you know, these recordings uh, will be soon lost. You know, these are cassette tapes, uh, video cassettes, and nobody is doing anything for them. I tried to get some money to digitalize them, but as, as Kukaja is not a really endangered language, they said it was not a priority. So very sad, you know, um, nothing I can do. Unfortunately, I cannot take the, the cassettes with me out of the community. So, well, so this is old Kukaja. Old Kukaja at some point developed into a variety we'll call Mission Kukaja. And why is that? Well, Balgo, you don't know Balgo, the place where this language is spoken, was uh, founded as a mission uh, in the mid 20th century. Um, it was a Catholic mission, actually, uh, Catholic missions made a great change in the area. They brought together people from very different communities and they actually assumed a language uh, would be a ling the lingua franca in the community, in the mission, and that was Kukaja. However, as people from many different origins that spoke different languages came to this mission, um, this Kukaja in a way simplified and acquired uh, characteristics of these other uh, for instance, Ngumen Yapa languages, etc. Later on, this mission Kukaja developed into the new Kukaja, and this is more of a name that has to do with the fact that Balgo is not a mission anymore. I would say that mission Kukaja and new Kukaja are actually the same thing, you know, spoken just by two different generations. New Kukaja, however, is characterized by a more heavy or heavier influence, sorry, of Aboriginal. English and Creole. And finally, there is a new variety that people tend to refer to as Inkuja or Kukaja Remix. Now, some people use Remix, some people use Inkuja, some people say English Kukaja, but Inkuja has become um, uh, quite famous recently. And it's a variety that has incorporated uh, more elements from Creole and Aboriginal English, also some elements from Kija. Uh, Kija is a language spoken very close to the town of Halls Creek. That's uh, a three-hour drive, three, four-hour drive from Balgo. 
and uh, people have incorporated some elements from Kija, not because Kija people live in Balgo, but because Kija people speak Aboriginal Creole, and that's the people they are in touch with uh, quite frequently. Okay, so this is Ingrid, I'll show you some examples. So if we look, we, if we have a very superficial look at the, um, well, uh, at the characteristics or the difference, sorry, between Kukaja and Inkuja, we see um, some important um, differences. Well, one, before I, I continue, is that elders in the community don't really like Inkuja. They say that they don't want it, it's, it has no prestige. But um, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, I have been analyzing more and more data from elders. And actually, uh, many of them are the ones who started speaking Inkuja, and they still speak Inkuja these days, you know. Um, um, it's not just young people. I thought it was more of a young people phenomenon, but it seems to have been um, incubating for over 40 or 50 years. So Kukaja, for instance, has no uh, diphthongs. Inkuja does have some diphthongs every now and then. Um, Kukaja has a typical Pamanyungan phonological inventory. Kukaja has a Pamanyungan inventory plus S. Um, that stems from the fact that Inkuja, in some cases, at least in the NP domain, has incorporated some plur uh, plurality marker S. So these, th these two things go together. There are no determiners, no articles in Kukaja. Inkuja has incorporated um, well, the notion of a determiner and an article, and they have ja that actually comes from ji ja, meaning this and that, and there meaning uh, um, that one over there. It has a rich tense mood and aspect system. Inkuja has a redo system. It has lost many of the traditional tense mood and aspect markers of the language. Uh, Kukaja has ngumpin yapa coverb constructions, and this I would say is mission Kukaja actually, and this has to do, this stems from the contact uh, history. Inkuja has uh, Ngumin Yapa coverb constructions as well, but with some Creole verb frames, you know, and Creole verbs frames are everywhere, and I'll show you some examples. Kukaja uh, has a very um, clear morphological uh, ergativity marker, in Kuja, uh, it's a bit in flux here. Gativity is not much present. Um, Kukaja uh, has complex predication. It's a uh, head initial. Well, in the case of complex predication, in Kuja sometimes is head final. Uh, phrasal verb like it has things like up, off, on as English, something that other mixed languages in Australia don't have. Kuka just uh, has serialization. Inkuja relies a lot on parataxis. Kukaja has many sentence modifiers. Inkuja only has one left, and that's the LP sentence modifier. Hope we have the time to see any of these examples. So, for instance, this is a uh, just to show you an example. Um, the, that horse and that emu bit a or bit our the small man. Oh, this is a late lampan there, sorry. That horse and that emu bit a small man, you know, and here you see, uh, well, uh, ergative everywhere, you know, in each one of the members of the subject. Then um, a one verb here, etc. You know, the typical Pamanyung and phonological system. Now let's have a look at Inkuja, and we see that it's a bit different. Chati Manadelu. The horse, that horse and that emu bit a small man, so it's actually the same. These two are descriptions from a picture book designed by Camilo Shanesi. Um, and here you see, well, ja, that actually came from ti ja, meaning that one. Dimana is the same, no ergative here. Ergat ergative is just uh, in the outlier member of the NP. And de, meaning there, right, comes from there. And emu, baitim, baitim, as this is a very Creole-like construction coming from bait, with a transitive marker im that comes from him. Manu is the inflectional verb here. This would be the co-verb with its Creole frame. Uh, manu meaning to grab. Uh, cha little man, the little man. So... Well, it's a kind of a nice example. Here are some other examples, more Inkuja examples. The horse and the dog were standing by the lake. 
Chatiman there and Cunyar, what they want to set away. Um, well, you can you can have a look at the examples yourself. Shirt pan kuchura on, put your shirt on. And here you see the uh, put on, you know, uh, cult in a way from English. Little boy palpi tunin chintu on. Again, you know, same construction. Um, the boy, little boy was putting his clothes on. And Timanadelu, kicking money, Sadie out. The horse is kicking Sadie out, you know. Um, here, same, kick him, kick him, manin, with a coverb construction, with a creole frame, the object here, and out, uh, very phrasal, uh, verb-like. So this is a, a bit to give you, well, it's just to give you an idea of what this inkuja looks like. If you have um, more questions on this, we can leave that for the end. So the questions are, is kinkuja a mixed language? Is it a generational lect? what type of mixed language that is. Um, it's a bit difficult, you know, as um, um, this is, of course, this is not code switching. Um, people are just using the language constantly among them. Many of them don't even have a competence of Aboriginal Creole. Um, could it be considered um, a language in layers? Well, maybe, I think, yes. But we'll get back to that in a moment. I will leave the question open in a way. The com is it conventionalization of Creole Kukaja code switching? Maybe. What percentage of Kukaja lexicon was maintained and Creole is something to be done and it deserves uh, more study actually. And who brought in Kuja in Balgo? Did boarding schools play a role in its development? Possibly. But the fact that I have found elders using a lot of Kukaja is really, um, well, it's. Um, uh, is a bit well. It changes a bit all my my narrative. I think it's something that's been happening for a um, for a longer time. This is a uh, painting by Melissa um, Melissa Melissa um, uh, Padun, um, who's the mother of Clifford, my main consultant. She actually um, made it for me. You know, this is these are people. You know, sitting around a fire in a community and this is supposed to be me because <laughs> I have a different color you know? and these are all the communities and the languages according to her you know how they interact it was very nice a very nice present from her that happened before I left and sadly I haven't been able to get back to Balgo and I won't be able to get back to Balgo um, before I well I will have to leave for Peru before that and maybe I won't be able to get back sadly Okay, now let's get to the shawi part. So in the case of, of, um, of, of Balgo and the Kukaja, we see that there were many languages in contact. There are still many languages in contact. People get to uh, speak these many languages. All these languages get to influence their modern competence. But in the case of shawi, when I was studying that back in the day, I studied from a very monoglossic perspective. You know, in this case, there are not many languages in contact. We can say that uh, shawi, is spoken monolingually in some of the communities and with contact with Spanish. So people are bilingually are bilinguals in Spanish and Shawi. A few of them speak Awahun, but that's just a minority in one of the communities. These are some of the pictures I took when I was doing field work in the Amazon. These are from 2014, 2015. Um, now it's not possible to get there, of course. You know, uh, sadly. Um, uh, the communities were hardly hit by COVID-19, but um, uh, well, thank God, this was well. They uh, none of them died, which is good news. You know, uh, none of them died. Many of the adjacent Awahun communities in the Upper Amazon were heavily impacted by COVID-19, and where there were many, uh, um, many deceased. You know, but in this case, no. And I'm happy about that. Um, no campaigns were necessary for the Shawi. They maintained their um, um, self-inflicted isolation until now. But um, some of them had uh, some headaches. They got the the the, the infection, you know. But um, uh, none of them died. They say it's their traditional medicine, but who knows? You no, know? I'm I'm really glad nothing happened to them. To be honest, I was really worried. Terrible months in my country. Okay, so where is Shawi spoken? Shawi. 
is a language spoken in the triangle form by the Escalera mountain range, which is this one here, the Marañón River, which is this one, it goes all the way from here, and the Guayaga River, which is this one, this is a triangle where the Shawi language was spoken. These days, it's a lot easier to get to all the Shawi communities because there are, uh, well, recently, um, build the highways that go from the city of Yurimawas all the way to some of the communities. But back in the day when I started doing field work a few years ago, now eight, seven, well, um, nine years ago, um, we, I had to gather by boat and it took over a couple, well, it took a couple of days to get to each one of the communities. Now it's a lot easier. Um, what you see the area in yellow here is the Shawi area. The pink area here is the area where Shiwilu uh, Shawi sister language is spoken, and the blue dot here is Munichi, a language isolate um, spoken within the Kawapanan area, inside the Kawapanan area, and that is not related to Kawapanan. It's related, of course, culturally, um, historically, but not linguistically. Now, the two dots here are very optimistic because Shiwilu and Munichi have what um, couple of speakers left, a few speakers left. Shawi is a vital language, uh, luckily. Kawapanan languages, well, this is the, uh, the prototypical uh, tree structure for Kawapanan languages. This is Proto-Kawapana or Proto-Kawapanan. And, proto and Kawapanan languages have three known, um, uh, there are well, three known uh, splits. We have Maina Sureño or Maina Shawi, as I called it, as has three modern um, um, dialects, the Kawapanas dialect, the Paranapura dialect, and the Chayawita dialect. There was another dialect that got extinct um, halfway through the 20th century and was known as Mikira, and that we know, know from, a, from a list of, uh, of words that a Czech um, explorer collected in the early, late 19th century, actually. I'm currently working on an article on this because it's, that's been a bit hidden <laughs> in the books. And um, Jevero, you know, a language that was uh, well described actually by the missionaries in the 18th century and that these days is heavily endangered and that's been described by the linguist Pilar Valenzuela and by Alonso Vasquez uh, in California. So, this is a study I carried out with, um, but before that, before the study. Now, when we have a look at Kawapanan languages, uh, we can see that um, Kawapanan languages, well, we can study them from a very descriptive perspective and say, well, there is this um, uh, uh, Shawi language, a very unit like Shawi that is not related to any other language around in the area that's not related to Awahun, that's not related to uh, Chicham languages that's not related to Quechua. We see that there are some words here and there that look like um, these other languages. Some linguists, at least um, South Americanists, uh, and some other linguists would say, yeah, it's contact, it's a reality, at least in the case of the constructions. Um, and I, liked, I wanted to look at this with more detail, and that's what I did. Uh, because probably my hypothesis back in the day was that maybe um, uh, looking at languages from this very unitary, this very monoglossic perspective was in a way biasing our idea of isolation, um, language isolation, or when a language is considered an isolate, or when a family is considered a, a small language family. And maybe what happened was that before the arrival of, of, the, of the Europeans in South America, given this more fluid situation regarding language um, uh, movement and development, um, um, there was, of course, uh, a similar situation as the one I, um, I presented to you regarding Australia. And um, there were many more languages in contact. People um, could speak many more language varieties, and this may have shaped um, their competences. And we may see the results these days. So modern, uh, our modern units may be relics or fossils of these uh, pre-Hispanic multilingualism. So if we have a look at different subsystems within the Shawi language, for instance, if we look at pronouns, which is a, a topic that not many, not many people want to have a look at, and we study them from a um, 
just a comparative perspective. This is a, a I would call it, I would call it a very simple um, uh, phylo Bayesian phylogenetic analysis of just pronouns uh, in South American languages. So we just picked the first four person pronouns in South American languages and we compare them. So here we are not saying with these trees that all these languages are related. No, because that is not the case. Here what we are uh, seeing is whether there are there is a sort of relationship between the pronouns in these languages. And well, nicely we nicely plotted some language families by just looking at pronouns, you know, but we can have a discussion regarding that later. But I want us to focus on this. That's something, um, well, of course, she, she, this is Shiwilu, actually, this is a Spanish name, and this is Shawi. Of course, they are related, you know, they are the Kawapanan languages, but their pronouns are very similar, if not identical, to um, a language spoken in Argentina, and that is Puelche. You see, green means very strong, red means very weak, you know, so we may disregard the weak parts. Or simply ignore them, you know. But if we look at the Kawapanan and the Puelche pronominal system, this is this dot, this green dot is Kawapanan, this uh, brown dot is Puelche. We see that they are basically the same. If we look at other domains of pronouns, also um, like uh, not pronominal critics, but suffixes or prefixes, depending on the languages, they are also the same. So there are several possibilities here. Some people like um, um, like Amerindianists. <laughs> um, like Rulen or Greenback, they would say that they are related. I don't agree with them. Other people would say that it's a coincidence. I don't agree with them either. Um, I would say that there is some, it's something in between, you know. I would say that possibly uh, these are a relic of some sort of relationship, not at the language level, but at the subsystem level. Um, we could speak of some sort of a reality typologically. If we look at the languages in here, so that are in between, like Aymara, Leco, um, Kunsa, Atacameño, right, and um, the languages in here, we will see that they share bits and pieces, parts of these systems. Not all of them, not all the, the persons, um, but they are in there, you know, showing us that there was possibly something back in the day. Maybe uh, this is the fossil of the migration of these people, etc. Now, shall we also, and um, Kawapanan languages in general, have a very strong Arawa component that uh, in most cases comes from uh, ritualistic practices, ceramics, the building of house, ceramics, sorry, the building of houses, etc. Some, uh, also some animals that live in the lowlands their names come from Arawak languages. You know, here, well, there are some examples. I was, I was just trying to put them all in there for you to see. There are many, you know, and many more that I was not able to put in here. Yeah. This was, well, I think we are at, at like 50 minutes right now. Yeah, yeah. I will end in 10 if you <laughs> uh, let me finish. Perfect. Yeah. So um, uh, this was actually adapted from uh, Jolkeski. Jolkeski added words that were of course, not. They had nothing to do with Arawak languages. This was um, um, heavily filtered by me. <laughs> okay. Then also something interesting is Kawapan and V clusters. This may be interesting to um, to some syntacticians. Kawapanan languages are um, uh, have uh, a specific type of branching. They are suffixing languages. So as you see. Um, um, all the, um, um, we can say suffixes and prefixes appear on the right on the tree, just to make things clear for people that uh, are not familiar with these trees. But, you know, there is a specific part of grammar that is valency changing operations that deploy prefixes. You know? um, that may be superficial for some linguists, but I was actually interested in that because I found it quite unusual for the language. And uh, interestingly, these um, um, prefixes occur very frequently, if not always, in Arawak languages that don't have the same type of branching, but that have the opposite type of branching, you know, that are prefixing language, uh, verb in well, SVO languages, not SOV as Shawi, etc. And the interesting thing is that Shawi, 
even though it is a verb final language, it branches to the right here, it has maintained the grammar of these predicates. It has maintained the branching directionality of these predicates. And it, 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 they, it, they have been maintained um, intactly, you know, they have been maintained entirely. They haven't been changed, they haven't been readapted to the Kawapanan system that's mostly suffixing, etc. These are uh, the only exceptions in the grammar, and I find it quite nicely because they come from Arawak languages that have precisely the opposite um, uh, syntactic structure. Now, the alienable marker that also occurs in Munichi, by the way, but this is you know, just for people who know something about Amazonian languages, this n, you know, is also comes from Arawak languages. The verbalized t that also occurs in Munichi, the isolate, in Shao, in Shiwilu, etc., seems to be also from an Arawak origin. You know, Mili Cravels and Heinfer the Vort say that it's actually an aerial trait. They don't provide any origins to that. I think it's mostly Arawak. And this has to do with the Arawak matrix, the Arawak trait roots. You know, if you have a look at the languages that have t, um, that are non-Arawak, these are all the non-Arawak languages, the ones in brown and the green are the Arawak languages that have t, it actually follows the roots. Now, there are also some Chicham Kawapanan. Um, but before I get to these, there is also a, la um, a great deal of Carib lexicon in Shawi, and that is mostly core lexicon, and that has to be uh, studied more in the future by through a collaboration with people studying Carib languages and Kawapanan languages. Um, I won't be touching upon that now, but I just wanted to mention that to you. So in the case of um, uh, Jivaroan and Kawapanan languages or Chicham and Kawapanan languages, there are some similarities that can be traced all the way back to Proto-Kawapanan and Proto-Chicham. Um, we cannot really say where they come from, whether they come from proto kawapanan or whether they come from proto chicham but what we know is that these languages have been in contact, and even nowadays there are some uh, small clusters of bilingualism uh, in these communities, and that has resulted in the implementation of the question marker ka just in one single variety of Shawi, in one single village, and that's precisely the village where Awahun is also spoken. And the question marker ka is a characteristic of Awahun, you know, or well, um, Chicham languages in general. I know that this is a very common question marker, but Kawapana languages don't have any sort of interrogative marker um, for polar questions or for questions uh, at all in this position. In this position, sorry. So here you see, this is the Ka, you know, in, in Awaruna, sorry, um, here. So if we look at um, at the development of Kawapanan languages, and, and of course I will be dealing here with a bit of speculation based on what I found in this pie, in this layered view of languages, we can see the history of Kawapanan languages as a layered history where quite possibly there were many different groups of people in different parts of um, in, in northwestern Amazonia with different linguistic and ethnic ethnic backgrounds sorry that were in contact with each other and constantly reshaping uh, their competences to communicate now these through time fossilized and became what we nowadays know as Shawi and Shiwilu now something I didn't mention was that Shawi at some point was also a lingua franca in the mission in the missions founded by the Jesuits in the 17th century and actually the Jesuits were the ones who gave a name to this language something I didn't mention that has a lot to do with the glossography of power that plays also a role because maybe had the Jesuits uh, not arrived in the region, maybe we would have an idea of Kawapanan languages very different from the one we have these days, and as a conglomerate of different small Kawapanan languages, as is the case of Chicham languages, where you have three, four, five languages that are very similar to one another. But we, well, um, I don't want to <laughs> delve too much into that because I know you're not experts in Amerindian languages, <clears throat> but this would more or less look this way. I'm not going to read it, but you can 
get an idea of what I mean as different groups leaving their own traits in Shawi. Now, when we have a look at Shawi as a unit, we just see one block, but actually it's a bit of a cake of different layers of information that are showing us this very polyglossic past. Okay. So would this idea serve us these days? I think so. You know, with this idea, the idea of a polylectal internally dynamic competence, a competence that at some point, uh, or an idea that at some point could help us um, um, rework our ideas of competence and, this, and grammatical descriptions and typology. Well, I think it would, but I think we would need to get rid of many um, prejudice regarding our models. You know, in, nowadays what we see is that uh, formal linguists work independently, typologists work on their way, they, there are stupid fights uh, at crossroads, but uh, if we dialogue a bit more, I think this would, and we uh, tend to rely less on um, uh, these very um, uh, sect-like view, <laughs> sect-like behavior we have in linguistics, where we um, um, interact not just with the people of our own sect, you know, like our own functional typology sect, our own LFG sect, our own uh, Chomsky sect, but we'll try to have a bit more of a dialogue then I think that um, we'll get to know more about the nature of language in history and how uh, this is reflected in individual competences recursively, um, synchronically, you know, these days in our minds. So, but I'll leave these ideas with you as I'm running out of time. Uh, to all of you. My, my Hungarian is, is minimal, I only know a few words. But um, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity once more. Thank you to the Hungarian Academy of Sciences for the invitation. I'm really honored um, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So now the floor is open for discussion. Any questions or comments? Well, okay. I can can start. Nobody. Okay, so like you mentioned, so when you listed quite a few features of these languages, like having articles, not having articles, head final, head initial. So when you do your field work, so how do you find your research focus? Because these these things are are whole research fields by themselves. So like just when you say like there's an article or no article, that's a, that's a very superficial observation about a certain language. So like. Uh, uh, and each could be investigated in 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 a very large depth. So how how do you find what you go into in more detail? Or so how uh, do you yeah, how, how do you question. go beyond this superficial kind of description of uh, yeah. features? How do you go beyond? Well, at this stage, at least in the case of um, when you're interested in grammar and the way grammar is processed in the mind, for instance. Of course, you have to focus on some of the features, you know, and that's what I did with the, with the ergative marker in Shawi, you know, that um, there is some variation in there. It's quite a, an interesting construction. Of course, I don't have the time to present the whole thing on ergativity here, but um, you have to focus on single constructions. For instance, I'm interested in, in that particular ergative marker. Now I'm interested in, 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 in um, indefinite markers in Kukaja, in ergativity as well. Uh, there are some features I can cherry pick now for you to, uh, for this showcase, but the um, the take home message is that someone has to do something about that. You know, I'm of course as a as a, as one individual, I am not able to study in depth each one of these phenomena by myself. You know, I need to focus just on two or three in depth, and that's what I have been doing uh, more and more. First, we need an overview. You know, to see what is possibly going on in each uh, in each one of these scenarios. But then it's the work of the syntactician or the morphosyntactician or the theoretical linguist to uh, delve a bit more into each one of these phenomena and see what's going on. You know, um, how are people processing these, um, these, 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 how is people processing this variation, for instance, you know? That's why I say, writing a polylectal grammar, you know, in the in the gist of Bailey and Surin, is not something that can be done 
in three years or in four years. It's something that would take a lifetime or more and the work of maybe hundreds of intellectuals at the same time, you know. A lot has been done on the um, on English, for instance, and Spanish and the and the big languages from a very uh, monoglossic perspective, yes, but it's been done, well, we have uh, the history of linguistics for those languages is is vast, you know, and there are many people working on the, on those languages. But in the case of these small communities, first we need to approach them from this perspective and then we can delve into that. There are people that write grammars, you know, um, and the question, and I would say that your question would also uh, go to them, you know, uh, when you write a grammar of a language, are you really getting really deep into one of the constructions you're describing, you know? I think that grammars are just but a a picture, a very superficial picture of actually what's going on in terms of language production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Kelsey, and if you go do go into like one of these constructions, you still need a theoretical framework, like a, like a syntactic. Most theoretical. definitely. Yeah. So, and 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 what would you use, or have you used any particular framework? Because that partially determines what your questions will be. Uh, most definitely. Like, like I'm generative know. linguist, I, I want to study like pronouns. Okay, I will ask questions about binding relations. I don't know. Uh, so I will construct my entire I don't know research uh, agenda yeah. along those lines, and that will you ask that the... question. Yes. Uh, from the very beginning of my presentation, I say that I I follow the ideas uh, from Bailey, Siren, Macaulay, etc. That means that I, in my case, I use semantic syntax. That is a transformational approach to language. But now, uh, the modern um, view of uh, dynamic linguistics that I was presenting today, of course, I, I had no time to delve into a single phenomenon, like, for instance, prelexical syntax. I can do that some other time for you uh, in another forum. But um, um, the modern um, uh, view of dynamic linguistics, which is which stems from semantic syntax and generative semantics, incorporates many of the ideas of LFG. For instance, at the um, at the level of case marking and agreement, you know, but we still work uh, we still work with transformations, and that's something you don't necessarily do, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I work from that you can call hybrid model based on my own experience because I think that um, that provides a solid framework to the phenomena I, I observe, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the framework I use, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you can analyze this from any framework, you know, from LFG, from a Tomskian perspective, a minimalist perspective. I don't do that, you know. Um, uh, that's why my trees are uh, are not binary. You saw my trees, mm -hmm. you know. Um, my trees um, sometimes uh, have predicates, as, has, have semantic primes as, as predicates, not verbs, you know. Um, so, of course, that stems from that, but I think that in any framework, if we pick, say, Chomsky minimalism, LFG, or any, uh, or even my semantic syntax, and we have a look at the, at this fact, you know, that, for instance, the case of valency changing markers in Arawak languages and Kawapanan languages, we see that there is a fact, you know, that Arawak languages have a prefix in grammar, verb initial grammar, uh, Kawapan languages have a verb final grammar and a suffix in grammar, but there is something in common between the two of them, and the, are these are, are these prefixes, for instance. We we see this phenomenon. How can a language that has a very different typology have these prefixes? That's a question. As a descriptivist, I could say, shall we and should we have three prefixes, and I tell you their functions and in which cases they are used. But as a, but as a theoretical linguist, I'm not interested in that because I, I want to see why the gra how the grammar is doing that. And I'm not going to say that my grammar will turn some suffixes into prefixes because I find that totally ridiculous. You know, I would say that actually from a dynamic perspective, people, when they were interacting with Arabic speakers and were possibly competent in some sort of pidgin or our interlingua, Arawak interlingua, managed to incorporate their knowledge of these particles from that language and they chuck it all together with their Kawapanan competence and the result through time is what we have these days. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, sorry. 
could have more questions, but I would like to give the floor give that to somebody else. So if you have questions. Okay, maybe I have a question, if I may. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, thank you for your exciting talk, first of all. I'm a sociolinguist conducting field work in Hungary. So I was just wondering about that uh, when you conducted your uh, participant observation. How hard uh, was it to get accepted by the community to be able to conduct your uh, field work at all? And uh, how much time uh, did you spend there uh, to, to be involved in the uh, community and to start your field work? It's really yeah. exciting. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question. It's, it's act, that's actually something crucial when you do field work, to get accepted by the community. In some cases, the outcome is bad and you don't get accepted by the community. So what you have to do is to leave. There's nothing you can do. But in case, well, um, when I got to Balgo, for instance, in the case of Australia, you know, of Western Australia, the thing was that I was not a white Australian. So the first impression they got was like they were curious about my country and that was my way to approach them you know, they were curious about me where i came from why i was studying uh why i wanted to study uh, an australian aboriginal languages you know, give, give, given that i am from peru you know they hadn't even met a single peruvian in their lives so that was a my first approach was um i would say very lucky because i was in a way accepted very fast just because of that curiosity you know and then I had to talk to the Aboriginal Corporation in Balgo, um, give some sort of a talk um, to the elders to seek their uh, their acceptance. You know, and see, I, I, well, explaining to them what I what I was looking for, what I wanted to do, and what my plans were in terms of um, well, giving back something back to them. You know, and in the for the past couple of years, for instance, I wrote an, um, a Kukaja learner's guide for the community. That was one of the, uh, they asked me to write a Kukaja learner's guide, a complete guide that if everything goes well, will end up being published this year. If we get the funding, now it's a bit difficult to get funding for this kind of publication, but we have to publish it. And so it's there written and um, then finding the consultants and you have to get an authorization from each one of them some people don't want to work with you you know some people do want to get to work with you so the first approach is to work with one family first you know because and then get to understand what the dynamics are in the community because some people like this family some people don't like this family if you end up working with the wrong family then you might end up crashing the whole field work <laughs> and then it's a then you cannot do it anymore because they hate each other sometimes and there's nothing you can do about that and you cannot solve those problems. So um, you really have to be very careful and be very observant about these, all these situations, you know. And first learn the language, you know, get to live a bit with them, get to share a bit, get to share time with them. And then you ask to work with them. Of course, they get paid for that. That's uh, the way it is here in Australia. They have to be paid. In the case of Peru, uh, before that, and in the case of um, another thing is that in many cases, it was my first consultants that then themselves that after training um, in the use of, of the tablets and ELAN, they collected the data themselves and transcribed the data with me. So um, that uh, in a way uh, allowed me not to be there and, and bias a bit the, uh, you know, the, the results. Then in the case of the Shawi in, in the Amazon, I was a lot younger back then, and um, it was more difficult, you know, to get used to a very, a very different world, you know, um, living in a very different way with all the commodities we have in the cities. Uh, but the, the process was very similar, you know, getting to live with a family. The, the difference was that, of course, I had to walk sometimes an hour from one community to another through the Amazon to get to meet some of the other families. And um, uh, acceptance was different. It had to be made at, in the community council with the leader, just with the leader of the community. And he would give me his authorization to work with everybody, you know. Yeah, so very different in that case. You know, he would say, first, you have to go through me. He would give me a letter. 
uh, that he would write himself, and then I would be allowed to work with the rest of the community members. Then I would ask individually, of course, but actually the, the paper you need to get the, the acceptance is, is, is the Apus, and he is a man. Uh, uh, recently, there are some Apu women, um, but that's still well, very new, you know? um, very patriarchal society. Thank you very much. <laughs> What lang language did you interact with them initially? So like, do, so like, they speak like Spanish. So like, they are polylinguistic. Uh, so like Spanish and English with in Australia. Or so, what's the language of the initial contact? I got. I guess or question, you speak you know, these languages. Some, some people sell the idea of doing monolingual fieldwork from scratch, and I would say it's really useful, you know. But the truth is that these people at least in the case of Balgo and among the Shawi, they speak Spanish as I do when I speak to my friends, you know? So sometimes when I try to start all the way from the beginning to just speak Shawi, they wouldn't want to. They'd say, no, I don't want to speak Shawi. You know, I want to speak Spanish, you know? And then progressively, sometimes uh, spending time with them around them as they talk to each other in Shawi, then I would get a gist of the language and that would progressively grow and grow. But the interactions at the beginning were very, um, I would say, in the code switching terrain, you know, not purely mm -hmm. monolingual. They were monolingual in some cases with elders, yes. And I had to learn the language from scratch in the community, you know, um, because sources were very poor. At least in the case of Shawi, there was a, a very short grammar sketch published by Helen Hart in the 80s. But apart from that, there was no other way to learn the language. So um, you start with very simple questions. The, the type of, ling of, of training you get as a field linguist when you're a student, you know, getting with uh, first your transitive verbs, like transitive verbs, then you go with basic vocabulary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you build your own sketch and then you get to grow and move on from there, you know? Yeah, I see. But I, if I would, if I, if I told you now it was purely monolingual all the way from the beginning, no, well, no, that was not the case. It was monolingual sometimes, but not always. I, I may just have a quick uh, comment. Uh, yeah. So let, let me do that, and then I think maybe Polybatch also wants to ask a question. Okay. So. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, uh, it's just a quick one. So the this creolization process that you showed in Australia, that, that's very interesting because it seems to be very rapid and, and within the native community, as far as I can understand that. So that was a very curious case for me because that's not the prototypical case of creolization. So what, why did this happen? Uh, um, well, I would say that um, this is not a case of creolization it's a case of language mixing um uh more of the of the language mixing type as you find with Gurindji creole or light walpri in australia or some other mixed languages like at the japanese in taiwan um or uh, mischief etc but um uh, there is a bit of creolization in the sense of semantic transparentization you know, of the language um, in that sense yes you know um, or, or the critical so, evidence you had in the examples that's yeah. yeah yeah so that is yeah so that is creolization in that sense because those elements come from Creole as well you know um, but uh, that is happening because of the very heavy influence of Aboriginal English, Creole, in the, and, and Creole in the media. That's very popular. You know, Aboriginal Creole has a very high prestige in, in these communities. You know? Not in Balgo, because in Balgo the lingua franca has always been Kukaja. But what we can see is that Kukaja is reshaping itself into a more um, uh, Creole-like variety. You know? Okay. But Creole and Kukaj are very, very different. You know. Okay, thank you. Uh, Palibachi? Okay, my, <coughs> sorry, uh, my question uh, would sound 
not a linguistic, but I am very much interested in what chances for survival you see for these languages. Uh, how many speakers uh, well, use, uh, are using these languages actively? Is there any literacy? Uh, are these languages taught at schools or which of them uh, which of them uh, are taught at schools and uh, the number of speakers and so on, okay? Thank you for your question. <laughs> to put it in yes. a nutshell. So. Yes, it's very, uh, well, it's, I would say that the situation in some cases is very sad. You know, at least in the case of Kukaja, um, Kukaja is spoken by some 300 people, you know. Now, there might be some more because they are all polyglots, you know, so they speak many languages. But um, the, um, the truth is that the literacy program implemented in Balgo in that community ended sometime in the late 90s. There, there were tons of books written in Kukaja, but they have been forgotten with time. They are stored. Nobody uses them in the Wakala Center. So um, there is not much future in that sense. And as you see, Kukaja is it's going more towards a Creole, and um, and children are speaking more and more Aboriginal English. You know, so I would say that the future is not very, not very fortunate for these. Um, or at least I don't see a very fortunate future for Kukaja. I see more of a, of a transition scenario that involves English fully, you know. Also, if you have a look at social media and the language people interact with, it's mostly English. Now, in the case of the Shawi, in the case of the Shawi, the situation is different. There was no literacy, but uh, the Bible, everything was translated into Shawi, you know, back in the day. And all the Shawi have intercultural bilingual education um, for the whole primary level, you know, for pr primary school. So that is somehow helping. And what you can see in the media is that the Shawi are creating music, they chat in their language, even if there are not many books in the language, you know. And uh, Shawi has over 21 to 25,000 speakers. So the, um, uh, the numbers, although well not, they are nothing compared to the numbers of European languages, of course, but it's, um, it's, it's not such a dire situation. Um, I would say that uh, I could, we could be more optimistic about Shawi uh, continuing to be spoken in Northwestern Amazonia for at least a couple more generations. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, your lecture was fascinating, let me tell you. <laughs> I uh, thank you. really thank enjoyed you. it. Thank you so much. I wanted to say hi to my friend Harold Hammerstrom, who is there. I haven't seen him in, in years. It's good to see you, Harold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I, I, can I have a, like a, a question about some sort of detail or just my the technicality? Okay. It's, it's just perhaps me not being like educated enough. But you mentioned like fourth person pronoun. What, what's that? What's like? I, I know I want to three. Perhaps it's just my my lack of knowledge. What's what's a fourth person pronoun? That's a that's actually a good question, and I got it. You can't imagine how many times. <laughs> But it depends on, on, well, in the Andean tradition of linguistics, um, when you look at Andean languages like Quechua and Aymara, what you would, will see is that there is a first person, a second person, a third person, and the person that's semantically equivalent sometimes to the we inclusive or we exclusive, depending, has a different form that is not derived from the first person. It's a totally different form. It's not an inflected form at all because these languages are not inflectional, but it's very different. And sometimes we call it a fourth person. That fourth person has its own set of suffixes, etc. And like the second person plural, for instance, that's just a second person plus a plural, you know, mm -hmm. as a plural suffix, say. That's why we call it a fourth person. So in many South American languages, you can find a fourth person. In other languages, you don't find a fourth person. You find just a normal first person dual, first person singular, inclusive, exclusive, etc. So it's based, it's a distinction based on form, at least in the Andean tradition. So there's a, 
like first person plural and apart from that there's a fourth person yes you can create that, what's the difference one. between in the ref okay i see the different forms but in terms so, of reference sometimes exclusivity sometimes ex exclusivity sometimes it's stylistic in the case of exclusivity uh, um, you have sometimes a fourth person that would actually refer to what we call a first person inclusive and the word that is derived from the first person into the first person plural it's the exclusive you know mm -hmm. yeah and well if i just can add to this you know sometimes it's argued that second person plural pronouns are just the pluralization of you or third person plurals are just the pluralization of he or she but uh first person plural is not a pluralization of i yeah so, in, well, in, maybe yeah so yeah. so we can expect such differences yes, in language that's systems. true uh, the the thing is that in these languages and uh, there is a a very important influence in the form and then the and, and then um the formation of suffixes the suffixes in the language in the grammar etc um that's that's it's but a formal distinction it's not very typologically sound but it makes sense when you look at forms and that's what i was looking at when doing these comparisons Mm -hmm. Okay, then I might have one last question, like a, like a summary, summary question or something like that, yeah. uh, if there are no more questions. So like at the end of your talk, me. you had these very <laughs> inspiring ideas about uh, having a dialogue between uh, different approaches to languages and, 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 and uh, different approaches of linguistics and, and we can have a common understanding which contributes to a deeper uh, understanding, so that's very inspiring, but what would that mean in a in actual practice, so like, well, like, let's say I am some of us Schism. are generative <laughs> linguists. Okay, either Chomsky and LFG, whatever generative linguists. Okay, I want to incorporate uh, a more dynamic view into my my research program, my research approach. So, uh, so what would that mean to me? So, like, uh, apart from like uh, being open mentally, whatever, but uh, how would well, I approach I think... data or theory or or language uh, in my my work? I think that if you're a Chomskyan, it's very difficult. You know, um, it has been tried by Enoch Abo um, in in the model that he calls hybrid grammars very recently. You know, but the problem is that what underlies at the bottom is always the structural division between semantics and syntax that I dislike. You know, so but it's been tried you know in the case of lfg i think there is not much of a problem because that di that division you have in terms of dimensions could easily be applied from a dynamic approach and i do it all the time when i look at case marking systems etc if you look at dimensions for instance and you look at um at these systems from other languages you have to find a way to map these new systems into something from a given dimension uh, say I don't know, in the case of, um, um, I don't know how you would deal with valency changing operations. I'm not very familiar with that part of LFG, but there should be a way to do it, you know. Now, the dynamic approach stems from, the gener from generative semantics, from semantic syntax. That's a fact, you know. So if you want to do dynamic linguistics and you are a Chomskyan, what would that mean? You, it would mean that you would have to abandon autonomous syntax, you know. But that would not mean that you have to abandon transformations and many of the other things you like about the grammar. This would entail a huge debate, and I'm, I, I am no authority to be the leader of such a debate. I think there are many, um, there are much better linguists to do that, such as uh, Hatch Ross is still alive, or Peter Sir, and or uh, uh, John Bresnan in the case of LFG. Um, I wouldn't know how open the Chomsians are to do such a thing. But that thing would be really nice and necessary to reunify uh, our models, you know, and don't have this thing. Now it's basically a club thing. I haven't seen a science like that, you know, where we all have different dogmas. And uh, it, it's, I mean, we can have very different uh, beliefs on processes, but at the, and the, at the bottom, at least we should agree on something. And I don't see we agree at the moment. I think it's a terrible problem. And that's why we have very radical schools like construction grammar and cognitive grammar that uh, really neglect all, what has been done in our field and rely on very soft models, you know, that uh, are all fits in models, you know, that I don't necessarily agree with. 
but that I, th I think that are detrimental to the understanding of language, but that's an opinion. You know? So don't take it as an offense for the ones that, <laughs> that follow these models. Uh, but what is necessary to be done? A huge debate, you know, an open debate, as it was done in the old times, you know, open journal debate, you know, what is variation? How would we incorporate variation? What is, again, the core of grammar? Is semantics at the core or not? You know, if semantics is at the core, is variation at the core, or at least the possibility of play with variation, the mechanism that makes variation internally variable, is that at the core or not? You know, that has to be put into, um, put out, you know, at some point. Someone has to do it. Um, and that's why we don't read each other, you know? The LFG people know nothing about semantic syntax anymore. You know, the semantic syntax, well, it's a radical view of language that's been forgotten because of the, of the wars, you know, and there was a political turmoil in there. But in the case of all the models, it's, um, it's necessary, you know, to bring it back forward and, um, and do something. You know. Otherwise, we'll end up with um, um, some Sherry talking all the time, you know, <laughs> just uh, mm -hmm. descriptive views of, of linguistics. We will get back to, to the 17th and 8th century talking about how climate influence language, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> because otherwise some people will get offended. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Should we close the event? I thank, thank him. I don't hear you. Yuri, you are muted. Um, my apologies. I forgot to unmute my, myself. So uh, thank you very much once again for accepting our invitation. That was a very interesting talk. Like we, we rarely hear about these things here. And also the discussion, I, I really enjoyed it. So this has been a great day so far. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you everybody for the invitation, for the honor to be here. And thank you to all the presents you know, who have come from all corners. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. So, so Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye okay. bye. Bye bye, everyone. Have a nice Thank day you. or a nice evening in your yeah. <laughs> good, good night. Good <laughs>